from the uh, Energy Corridor here in uh, Houston, Texas. I'm uh, Alan Bertain. I'm the uh, technical coordinator of uh, SEG Evolve, and I welcome everyone to uh, this week's gathering of the Fearless Explorers of the Future. Uh, we're very pleased today to have the first of two talks uh, from uh, Mr. Mike Forrest, and we'll be getting to that shortly, but I think we have uh, some new audience members here today, so I thought I would begin with just a few quick slides to explain Evolve so you have a context of uh, what you're participating in. So I'm now going to uh, share my screen here. Let's share screen. Get this one. Share. And let's go to full size. There it is. Sorry. There it is. Now, all good, uh, Jesus? Oh, good. Very good. Okay. So as we say, this is our uh, Fearless Explorer Friday ses session. We meet with our teams every Friday uh, as it is through the course of Evolve. And so at this phase, uh, we're inviting some well-known industry guest speakers to come give us talks. Uh, but uh, we call this Fearless Explorer Fridays. So for those of you who aren't uh, familiar with it, I'll just give you a very quick introduction to Evolve, uh, which is an SEG uh, program. Uh, it is a six-month part-time virtual internship for students. Uh, they have to put together a multidisciplinary team of five or more individuals covering the whole spectrum of expertise. This is collaborative, it is global, and it is fully inclusive. And what we're trying to do is to teach the skills necessary for these individuals and teams to be successful uh, in a multidisciplinary real-world digital setting. And that's what they're going to go to as they start their careers. One key element of Evolve <clears throat> is extensive mentoring by highly experienced industry experts like Mr. Forrest and others. Uh, these are just a few quick snapshots. So for those of you who aren't aware, uh, Evolve was initially founded in 2015. The idea actually began with uh, uh, some, uh, some of the individuals at Halliburton. Uh, we have since refined and developed the idea. And right now, these are the various companies and individuals that are supporting or sponsoring Evolve. And uh, notice, by the way, that we, again, are using Petrel, we're using DSG, Decision Space, in the cloud, Kingdom, and a variety of other technologies. So in the last uh, three years, which is once we adjusted the Evolve program, uh, this is a map showing uh, our uh, footprint uh, around the world. So we've had 55 plus teams. We've had over 300 students from more than 40 countries. So we're very pleased with uh, the distribution of our teams. And of course, every year we'll try and fill some of those gray gaps. And if you're from some of those areas, think about applying to Evolve 2021. I will note, if you look carefully at the bottom, you'll see that Evolve 2021 is going to include carbon capture and storage and uh, groundwater. So Evolve continues to evolve. Now, for those of you who are working and you say, oh darn, I wish I'd had my chance to get Evolve when I was a student. Well, we have good news for you, which is SEG has decided to offer Evolve Professional. This is for individuals with zero to 10 years of experience. Could be more actually, we all have things to learn all the time. Zero to 10 years experience working in oil and service companies. And again, it's a six month virtual internship but we do work with each company because they have different schedules and ways they want to do this. But uh, if, if you want to learn more about that, you can go to the website here. And at the moment, just so you know, we are currently working with the Oxy team. Uh, they are working uh, with us at the moment and next year or towards the end of this year, we hope to add a, a series of other professional teams. Anyway, I can only scratch the surface. If you want uh, to learn more about Evolve, of course, the SEG Evolve website, um, SEG of all professional is being offered through a new company we set up called next gen training partners. And that's where you can uh, sign up for Evolve professional. As always, please subscribe to the YouTube channel where we have a lot more videos, join our Facebook page where the news comes out or the LinkedIn group. So that's just a very quick summary. 
So now, of course, to the main order of business, which is the talk by uh, Mr. Forrest. Let me unshare my screen here in preparation for him sharing. And is that good? Did I unshare? Yes. Oh, Perfect. Good, yeah. So anyway, um, you know, I've had the, the really great pleasure of working very closely with uh, Mr. Mike Forrest here for the last three years. We've known each other longer than that, but uh, we really got to work closely and evolve. So he has a long and distinguished career. Uh, he first, his first career, and we're going to talk about several of them, was at, uh, at uh, Shell. And he worked there for about 30 years and then retired. But uh, he then decided to do something else. So he worked with Maxis and YPF and led that company uh, for uh, some years. And then after that, well, that wasn't enough. He wasn't ready to retire quite yet. So he set up the uh, DHI Consortium, which is a very well-known industry consortium. There's been, I think, about 35 to 40 companies that have participated and continue to participate. And that was his third career. He's slowing down a little bit on that, but he decided to take on a fourth career, which is to work in Evolve. And so he has been working very closely with me these last three years. It's a great pleasure. Uh, he works all hours of the day and night. He keeps a notepad by his bed in case he gets ideas in the middle of the night. And just a tremendous person to work with. And for the students to get to work with him, great experience. So with that, I think I will turn it over to Mr. Forrest. Okay, <clears throat> Alan, do you see my screen there? Successful right spot exploration. Uh, Jesus, can you, can you just confirm that you're seeing it for the- Yes, perfect, perfect. Go ahead. <laughs> All right, well, thank you, Alan. Um, we're gonna talk today about, you know, uh, right spot exploration, exploration prospects. I like to always say, and you've heard this before, geology first. In other words, you start with the exploration setting, you know, you can read papers and literature and other studies and you make regional structure maps and you end up with prospect areas, um, call them leads sometimes, it's a portfolio. And these can be structural or combination, combination means obviously structural and stratigraphic come uh, put together and stratigraphic traps. And you tie the wells, you understand the rocks, uh, you know, stratigraphic uh, variations, stratigraphy. And then you go into the detail of map and you have your best investment opportunity. And uh, then you estimate the volume resource. Remember P90, P10, volume ranges. Everything we do in geophysics and exploration has a range. And then we do geology, P sub G, and we have the five risk factors. So all of the teams um, on the SEG program here, HIVAL program, have gone through this exercise. And so that the next step, the next step is uh, we're gonna do bright spot interpretation over observed amplitude anomalies. So the first half here is gonna be technology. Uh, a lot of definitions, terms, you need that. The second half will be actual uh, prospects, uh, 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 a bright spot uh, examples around the world. We'll probably stop about halfway in and maybe have a short question and answer period, but okay, the very common used term is called direct hydrocarbon indicator uh, or DHI. You notice I say here an observation, which is it all starts with an observation. And in addition, uh, you notice I see the I state the word may. It doesn't work all the time. An observation which may indicate the presence of oil and gas uh, uh, pays accumulation. There are pitfalls, so it doesn't work all the time. So you have to be careful what you do. The second item there is AI, acoustic impedance, which is the, uh, the P velocity, compressional velocity times the density of a geologic layer. And of course the term bright spot, which was coined, I guess, back about 19, the late 60s. And what it is, it's just a local increase in amplitude on a seismic section or a map that may be caused by an oil and gas accumulation. Now, bright spots occur in good sands. Uh, the second talk in two weeks, we'll talk about AVO, and that has a wide variation of sand porosity from 30 down to 10% or even 5%. But we're gonna talk about here, mainly bright spot 
which is normally in 25 to 30 percent porosity sands. And I see that little map, seismic line and map on the right side there. You see that amplitude anomaly, and you see the, the say, structure map. So the amplitude outline fits the structure. So it fits a, what we call down dip con conformance. In other words, it could be a possible oil gas uh, water level. I mean, oil water level or gas water level. And a flat spot, that, that's, that line may have a little flat spot there on the bottom. And flat spot is my bottom point here where the gross sand is thick enough. We'll talk about tuning thickness. But you can see the top and the bottom of the sand, so you get a, a flat spot. So more on definitions, uh, reflection coefficient. You have a layer, you have a layer one and layer two, and each of them have a density and a velocity. All you're doing is reflection coefficient is the, the say density and, and the and the say velocity of the bottom layer minus the density and velocity of the top layer divided by the sum. So you get a, a what the term is, um, RC, reflection code. It's normally about 10%, sometimes less, sometimes more. If you get a bright spot, it could be 20%, maybe more. But think about it, it's, it's, a, it's a small number. So if you look at this little cartoon here I have, you got the, geo as I try to use my pointer here if it works, you got a geologic section here, layers. So, when you get a seismic reflection, it's from the interface from two geologic layers. It's normally, a, for our discussion today, it'd be a ceiling shale over a sand, and the sand may be filled with oil and gas. So you take the geologic section and you go to uh, AI, the acoustic log, and then you have these spikes. You see where the soft, I'll talk about in a minute, uh, low impedance, high, uh, high impedance, and then you have to then of bring in the seismic wavelet convolution. So you take these spikes and you convolve it with the seismic wavelet and you end up with a seismic trace. Now there's differences, of course. The geology is layers and it's a wide bandwidth. You see a lot of detail and it's vertical. Yes, the seismic is smoother. You see all the vari variations and the wobbliness. The bandwidth is limited. Normally, what, five hertz to maybe 60, 70, 80 hertz. And it's laterally depth, laterally. So you got the difference between vertical and the log and the seismic is more lateral. So then we go into more definitions, phase and polarity. This is very important. A zero phase wavelet is, you know, symmetrical around zero time. In other words, at each frequency, the troughs are lined up at zero time. So you see the, let's start here with the, this is a zero phase wave right here where I'm pointing to. And, you, and this diagram shows changes in the, in, the, uh, in the phase, 30 degrees, 60 degrees. You can see 180 degrees, it's reverse. So reverse polarity, we went from a trough here to a peak. Normally you can't tell observationally a 30 degree uh, phase change with the eye. So that you can see that the 30 degree is not very much different from the zero. So how do, I, how do I identify phase on my seismic data? Well, first of all, I look at the water bottom. It's usually hard. And uh, that may tell you whether you're looking at a hard or soft event, you know, high impedance or low impedance. But the best way is to have calibrated well ties, especially at a prominent uh, zone, so uh, uh, reflection levels. So phase is very important. And uh, if you have incorrect phase, uh, it can lead to errors, interpretation errors. You want the phase to be as close to zero phase as possible. By the way, it's never perfect. You want it to be as close to zero phase as possible for structural and stratigraphic interpretation. Now, here's a complication. We have an unfortunate polarity issue. Uh, the U.S. companies and U.S. data is normally what we call uh, American polarity. And the U.S. companies, a lot of them in Europe, I mean the European companies, have the opposite polarity. So you have to be careful when you're doing your interpretation whether you're looking at U.S. or American, U.S. polarity or European polarity. I've seen talks sometimes where the speaker goes from one polarity to, uh, to an uh, another, 
U.S. and a European, and you say, now what do you, you get mixed up, you get, you can't understand what exactly is going on. So this is a very important a terminology. So you see here, I have this uh, soft event. By the way, we use the word soft and hard normally. Uh, soft means, you know, low impedance, hard means high impedance. And that gets around this, this, whether it's US polarity or European polarity, just think of the term soft and hard. So in, in the normal uh, wave that uh, recorded, it's kind of like a mixed phase, a minimum phase, and maybe this. And the, the processing then, you try to bring it to a zero phase wavelet. As I mentioned, it's not exactly, not usually not perfect. And uh, so this would be the, the US polarity a peak, and by the red is, is common uh, color of, uh, around the world for, for say, trough or, 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 uh, or soft. And, and here's the, uh, the, the European polarity. So it's important that you understand that your data, whether it's US polarity or whether it's a, a, a European polarity early on in your, you know, on, in your prospect, you're doing your interpretation. <laughs> okay, you have to integrate geology. Uh, for example, stratigraphic changes, you can have uh, different sand shapes. You can have, a, uh, you can see all my, my pictures here. You can have a, a very sharp top, a very sharp top, kind of a, kind of a sharp base, uh, uh, gradational. So you have different wave shapes. And these wave shapes can make a difference what, uh, what kind of seismic uh, data you get. Uh, reflection. This, the, this may be a, this short peak may be a strong reflection on top. This would be a strong reflection on the base. You can also have variable, for example, I'll, I'll tell you later, you can have, you have, you have some dry holes. Well, some of them are just caused because you estimate the porosity incorrectly, like a 5% change or maybe 8% to change in the porosity can change the amplitude. And, and uh, it may result in a good amplitude being a dry hole. And you can have to also have a change in the overlying shale. I'll talk about that more in a minute. The normal practice is to tie wells, if you have them, of course, if you have wells available in your area and you make a synthetic and you make forward models and you try to compare, you use Gassman's equation and you substitute water versus oil versus gas and you can make forward models, we call them. And, uh, and just an example here on the right where the top uh, section here is gas and the bottom one is water. So you can see there is a huge, there's a substantial amplitude change uh, from, uh, from gas to water. So you want to tie your wells and you want to do forward modeling. Okay, now we go into more about acoustic impedance and the bright spot terminology. Uh, this came out of Alistair Brown. You can see at shallow levels, or let me say at, at, at levels where you have uh, the shale is harder than the wet sand and harder than the hydrocarbon sand, or say it the opposite, maybe a better way of saying it. The hydrocarbon sand with all the gas is softer or low impedance than the overlying shale and the down dip wet sand. Therefore, you will have a soft event, you will have a bright spot, and that's the bright spot world. You notice there's good separation as you, and you have to understand the polarity and the phase. Notice with depth, those curves converge. In other words, you get uh, lower porosity sand, you get stratigraphic variations, uh, the, the bright spot is normally 25 or 30 percent porosity. By the time you get down to a so-called dim spot, which will not really be talked about in this talk, you can have only 10 percent or 15 percent porosity. So it gets more difficult as you get deeper in the section and you get tighter rocks with depth. You can have, uh, you know, you have less separation. I like to say the word separation. You can see the bright has good separation between the sh overlying shale and the water and the hydrocarbon bearing sands. Uh, so we'll talk about bright spot in more detail. The second uh, uh, category is the reversal 
that's I'll, I'll touch on that. That's when the hydrocarbon sand is is softer than the overlying shale, but the wet sand is harder than the, than the overlying shale. And we'll talk about that in a second. Okay, so amplitude versus background. I will go into this a little bit more detail, but you're just measuring the, the amplitude scale versus the background. In other words, the regional, the regional seismic data uh, uh, nearby your prospect. And I'll show you that in more detail. And then you've got down dip con conformance. This has always been the number one attribute that you want to look for. In other words, all in gas, and you want to do it in, of course, an overall depth map. You know, we normally make time maps and seismic. Now they're going to go to this. So you want to do it in depth. And uh, so you're looking at uh, the down dip con conformance, just means that you may have a gas, it may be an uh, indication of a gas water level or oil water level, or it could be an oil gas contact as well. This is very important. This is one of the number one characteristics. A flat spot, I'll talk about that a little bit more in detail as well. That's where you understand tuning thickness, where the sand is thick enough where you can see the top and the bottom. And there's an equation there. You got the, uh, the, the velocity of the layer divided by four times the peak frequency, roughly. Calibration. Calibration is a key word in everything we do in, in DHI interpretation or bright spot interpretation. You want to tie the prospect technical data to nearby wells, of course, if you don't have them. If the, if the nearby well data is miles away, then you got to start making models and the risk it gets becomes, the prospect becomes more risky. Uh, and you want the amplitude maybe to be cons consistent. In other words, you've got, an amp you've got a bright spot area, let's say a couple thousand acres, you want it to be relatively consistent. Now, you can have faults, you can have stratigraphic variations, which will cause the amplitude to have good variations, of course. So, but generally, but this is, this, is con this is considered a pretty high rated attribute consistency, as long as you realize that faulting and stratigraphic changes can, that can impact that uh, consistency. So let's talk a little bit about amplitude over background. There's three ways to do it. Uh, yeah, let me just cartoon it here with a pointer. You can take, you can pick a window around the amplitude. It's, you, it's, it's a big window. And you just measure the amplitude, the top here. You measure the amplitude versus that background. Or you can make a, a window on top and measure the amplitude of the, uh, of the uh, uh, seismic reflection here, the bright spot versus the amplitude above, or you can measure the amplitude going off structure. You can see here the amplitude dims substantially as you go down flank. So an amplitude over two over five is considered pretty good for a bright spot. Now to get a five is probably gas, uh, but uh, and you notice flat spot here. So this is this is a this is a this is a high quality, obviously bright spot. Uh, and it's at shallow depth. You see, it's only there one second. So it's a, this is kind of an ideal case, but it, it helps you understand uh, how you uh, calculate uh, amplitude over background. And then you got this down dip uh, amplitude over background in a little more detail. Uh, this is an, a paper from 2006, and you, this has got probability on there. And, uh, so you can see, you start getting amplitude one and a half or greater, you may have some oil. And let's just say amplitude of two to three may be oil and over three up to five may be gas, but it could be a wet sand. There could be stratigraphic variations. It, it doesn't necessarily mean there's hydrocarbons. That's why you want to think about all these attributes, especially down dip conformance. So here's a little down dip conformance. This is almost a perfect case here. <laughs> where you see you got a couple of upthrown fault traps and uh, and you see the very strong amplitude upthrown to the two faults and uh, the down dip conformance is almost perfect on the southern uh, fault block there and uh, you can see the seismic line where the amplitude uh, uh, is very bright upthrown to those two. by the way upthrown fault trap <clears throat> because you've got an overlying shale, uh, shale uh, layer, which is a seal, and when you down, when you when you fault that down, you you have to sand against shale, 
and you got a higher probability of a, of a, of a trap, a higher probability of a seal. So you can see the amplitude is dimming as you go down flank there. And even though I don't have a scale on the amplitude versus background here, you can see that the up dip amplitude is, is much low impedance, much lower impedance than the down dip amplitude. So, so you can look at amplitude over background in a, in a, in a, in a cross-sectional view, and you can also look at it in a, in a map view. So amplitude background. Now, when you are trying to identify hydrocarbons versus uh, a shale, and by the way, some of our bright spots are just shales. I'll talk about that in a second, and our brine sands. There's overlap. In other words, you see here that the top left there, the porosity, I mean, uh, the, the uh, the p-velocity and the density, the, the chart on the bottom, whoops. You can see how they, the, the curves overlap. In other words, uh, a brine sand and an oil sand, I don't have oil on here, but think about oil in the middle there. A brine sand and oil sand and a gas sand, there's gonna be overlap. And a lot of the overlap is caused by say stratigraphic variations and, and or else uh, just variations in the, in, the, in the petrophysical data and the seismic data. So you got to remember this overlap issue, which is always present. So as I mentioned, down dip conformance, the number one for since 1970, by the way. And you know, Alan mentioned the DHI consortium. Well, this is put, this particular uh, graph uh, picture is published on the internet. And we have a system in the consortium where we have grades, but grade five is the best. So you can see there on the far right, I, I had a fault here and I got an up dip and I got a down dip conformance and it fits. It, and so that may be an oil water contract or that may be a gas water, a gas water contract. And you can see as you get, as you get variations, uh, you're gonna lose your confidence level. Now I put a little example down here on the bottom what if you have a channel crossing a structure? Well, obviously the, the channel may not, it's not gonna look grade five over here. It's gonna be at the channel will maybe have just to have conformance this here and see what I'm pointing my arrow on a contour here and here. So stratigraphic <laughs> variations will cause variations obviously in the, uh, the channels, for example, will cause variations in the seismic amplitude. So you gotta keep that in mind. You have to have a geologic model all the time, whether you're in a, in a, in a say, sheet sand environment or a shallow water uh, uh, deltaic environment or else a turbidite environment, channel environment. So you got to remember that, remember uh, uh, that, say, uh, geology plays a major role here. So let me give you a couple examples. Here's a down, this is a go, and uh, this is, this is pretty good fit. See all this is actual field. You can tell that with all the wells, but you can see the amplitude fits the down dip uh, closure here very nicely. And here's another one. Now you say, well, okay, what's what happened here? You got a fault here and you got down dip conformance here, but what happens on the east side? Well, it turns out the east side is cut by a number of shale field channels. And so this is, I call this a combination trap where the trap with again, geology, geology plays a big role in all this. You got the up zone, you got the fall, you got the down dip conformance, and you got a series of channels here, uh, which cut off the, uh, the, 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 the strong amplitude, the bright spot amplitude. So let's go into flat spots. A tuning thickness, you know, as I mentioned, it's, a, it's, it's related to the, 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 to the, to the frequency velocity and uh, it's basically the sand gets thick enough that you can see the bottom the top and the bottom and uh, you can see the little model there on the right uh, it, like we call it edge effects by the way where you have uh, a character change at expected hydrocarbon water line uh, uh, at the hydrocarbon water contact and you get a thick enough uh, layer that you can see the bottom uh, now I have an example that I personally worked on. This goes way back to 1970s, but where uh, uh, I was working on the map with another fella and actually he made the thickness map. I made the overall structure map and we estimated at 150 feet 
of gross sand. Remember gross sand, uh, that's the gross is another issue. We're not gonna talk about that today. This is gross sand. And the seismic line on the right side there, there's a, there's a, there's a little flat spot there on the bottom right here. Now it's interrupted by a, by a horizontal timing line, unfortunately, but there's a flat spot right there. So we drilled the well and we had 160 feet of gross sand and we had 66 feet of net gas in that sand. In other words, we could see the top and the bottom of the sand and we get a flat spot. Sometimes flat spots are spectacular. I will show you some later on. Well, here's one right here. This is uh, Nigeria. Uh, this, uh, this is actually a, a uh, oil gas contact and a gas water contact. So you see flat spot, flat spot, and then the amplitude. You can see the amplitude dims here as you go off structure and the amplitude dims here as you go off structure. This is so as I mentioned earlier, it doesn't work all the time. And so what you have to ask the question, what could go wrong? And there's several reasons. The first one is a wet sand. Uh, in other words, you have a you might have a high porosity sand or cleaner than you expected, therefore your interpretation was, was off, it was in error. You may have, this is more common than you think. The overlying shale is harder. You remember a high, you know, uh, higher velocity or, high, or, or higher density than you expect it, and therefore it ends up with a stronger seismic uh, event, reflection. Remember the reflection is from the shale sand interface. It's from that interface. It's not from the sand, it's from the shale sand interface interface. You can have stratigraphic changes, as I mentioned earlier, from the forward models. Like you have a short top sand, you never expected that. You can have ash in a sand. That's, and we've had cases of that in the Gulf of Mexico with low velocity. And you maybe just have no nearby calibration. You didn't have enough nearby calibration to understand what the rock physics was really telling you. So here's an example of, of a dry hole, for example, in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, you see the salt, the Gulf of Mexico, there's a lot of oil and gas trapped against salt. And you have amplitudes here down flank. It looks like they terminate against the salt. Now it turns out these did not have down dip, uh, down, good down dip con conformance. And those amplitudes were just wet sands. But let's talk about sands a little bit more. You can use the bright, the seismic amplitudes to map sands. In other words, in the deep water Gulf of Mexico, this is very common, and also other parts of the world in Afri West Africa, uh, uh, Nigeria, for example, Angola. You can map, you can map geologic patterns and, rec and, and using amplitudes and understand something about the depositional model. For example, you have channels here, you have lobes. But if you have a prospect, you have to have a geologic trap of some sort, structural stratigraphic, and the amplitude has to be stronger than the regional uh, amplitudes. But uh, this is a commonly used uh, uh, tool to you map sands, and uh, these are high porosity sands, you remember, 25 to 30%. So you see a wet sand, but, just, but when you get into a prospect and, uh, uh, where gas and oil may be present, you get a much stronger amplitude or a much higher density. Another pitfall that happens is low saturation gas, uh, residual gas. Now, what would you mean by that? Residual gas is, we think most of the time, it's a gas field that got away. In other words, a gas field that leaked, it, it had some late fault movement, you had some faulting that occurred, and, it's, and the gas got out, uh, escaped. So we use the term residual gas. And by the way, you can have a flat spot sometimes uh, when you have residual gas, and you can have good gas, 80% gas, gas saturation commercial over the low saturation gas. Very difficult to pre predict this technically. We're still having trouble 50 years later uh, than, than this was found to be an issue, how to really, how to really uh, understand this low saturation pitfall. You can also have gas in a non-permeable non sediment, like a, takes a little bit of gas in a, in a silt or a shale, and we have these as well around the world, and it shows up as an amplitude, it may even fit structure, and uh, it may have good DHI characteristics, maybe a good bright spot, yet it's not commercial. 
you may have uh, unexpected pathology, a low impedance. Remember, being, we're talking about we're looking for low acoustic impedance here. You can have soft, soft shales, which that's fairly common, by the way, in marls and coals, many yeah, are bare. You can have CO2. Uh, I know in Europe, there's a couple of areas I, I know that have CO, they're looking for, for, for gas, for methane, and they found CO2. Uh, and of course, you can have seismic data quality issues. So let's talk about low saturation gas. And this is a good example published in the Gulf of Mexico that on the left here is a gas field and it's a st structure. You see the good amplitudes here, two of them. And you got a pro you go across the syncline and you're over here, uh, more amp two amplitudes. And you say, oh, well, this is gas, that must be gas. There's one major difference is this big fault here, which you notice comes to the surface. Now, is that, a, is that a going to be a risk of seal? Are you going to lose your seal? And this going to be, is this going to be 80% gas saturation or those, what we call low saturation gas? Well, it turns out this was low saturation gas. And so what is it? In the King Kong field, the gas sand velocity was averaged roughly 6,500 feet per second. And the, um, in the prospect, Lisa Ann it's called, where you have low saturation gas, I'll go into this in a second. It's, it's about 10 or 20% gas saturation still left. You also had 6,500 feet per second. So it looks like a hydrocarbon bearing sand and it wasn't and it fit structure. So why does this happen? Well, the P wave um, velocity drops dramatically with a small amount of gas in the reservoir. This was discovered in 1973 by several companies. And you can, so you see at a 90% water saturation, which is basically 10% uh, gas saturation, you know, it's, a, it's a reverse uh, thinking, which we would normally call a wet sand, has essentially the same P velocity as a 80% gas saturation sand. In other words, you can't tell the difference between a 10% gas saturation sand and an 80% gas saturation sand. And so, uh, this is a major ca uh, cause of dry holes. Uh, and uh, as I say, we don't have the technology. No, if you, anything, any of you know about CSEM at shallow levels, it might work. It does work in some cases. Uh, but so we, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we use the term sprung trap. In other words, you had, an, you had, a, you had a gas in the, uh, in, in, it, it was a gas field. It just got away. It leaked through the faulting. You remember that? Remember I showed you on that, on that seismic line that fault goes all the way to the surface. It looks like that, that may have been the cause for the leak. Well, I didn't talk about masking and velocity sag for a second. You know, sometimes uh, yeah, I think some of the teams uh, have seen this on the, have observed this on the seismic data. You see a, a number of shallow amplitudes and you, get, and you get a velocity sag underneath it, low velocity. You fill it up, these fill up sands with gas at low velocity, you're gonna have a velocity sag underneath it. And sometimes it impacts the data quality. You're going to have masking. We call it word that we use the term masking sometimes, where the deeper seismic underneath the shallow amplitude is is weaker and and, and very difficult to interpret. So what you do, you take all these attributes and all this thinking, and you you make sure you got the right polarity, and you got the right. You think you understand the phase, and you're looking for low impedance, and you know whether you're, you try to figure out whether U.S. polarity or European polarity, and you go through a thinking process, a critical thinking process, and you end up with a final probability of geologic success. Which, by the way, we define as floatable hydrocarbons. It may not be economic, by the way. It just it. It's a gas flowing from that well. And so what is that number? Well, you take the geology piece of G and you may upgrade it based on, the, on these DHI characteristics or bright spot characteristics, downgrade it. Sometimes you may have a, a fairly high probability prospect based on G, but you do the amplitude analysis and it may downgrade the, the probability of success of flow of the hydrocarbon. But in good cases, on excellent process, prospects, that number can be as high, that final piece of G, as we call it, can be as high as 70 to 80%. Uh, and uh, 
which is much better than you can do with purely a, a geologic uh, uh, thought process for risk analysis. So we're gonna stop here for a second. Uh, do you have any questions? Uh, uh, I have a number of prospects uh, examples I'm gonna show next, that'll go fairly fast, but any uh, questions or comments, Alan, from the, uh, from the students? Let's see, I don't see anything on the, uh, the student internal uh, chat. I don't know if Jesus is able to see some of the um, YouTube or Facebook questions. Or Mario. Okay. So anyway, I hope I hit the highlights here that the, uh, it's a lot about this basic. Now this, this presentation was very basic. Uh, if you don't understand the basics, you're sunk. You don't, you don't have a chance. And, uh, so uh, uh, let's move uh, forward then to the, uh, to the prospect examples. Uh, this is real life examples. This is one that I personally worked on. We always, we always like to show prospects we've worked on in the past, but uh, this goes back to the seventies and you see we had a structural closure here. We had a dive pier in the middle here, salt or shale and there's a west flank here. And we had all these, this is shallow now, only 5,000 feet. And you had all these amplitudes here. Uh, there's actually four of them. And this is advanced processing and we end up with four amplitudes here and, and they fit structure very well. We, we had some wells nearby that we could calibrate to. Well, this ends up being a 200 million barrel field in four oil and gas sands at 5,000 feet. So that's a, 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 that's a, a big, uh, Big field in the Gulf of Mexico, on the Gulf of Mexico shelf. Um, now here's one also Gulf of Mexico, Augur. Now this happens to be deep water. This was found uh, in about uh, 1986 or seven. And uh, this is the flank of a salt dome. But all these amplitudes, see these amplitudes here? Uh, this is gas and oil. The main pay is down here, by the way, at 19,000 feet. So I showed you one earlier at 5,000 feet. This is 19,000 feet. Uh, and uh, this is 300 million barrels on the flank of a salt, many pays on the flank of a salt dome. You can see here at uh, the salt over here, there's a fault here. This is a down dip. Uh, this is the fit to a contour here, uh, con uh, conformance. Well, I can tell you back when we first found this field, this amplitude was poor quality at 19,000 feet, but then with newer quality advanced 3D, 3D seismic data and new interpretation tools, this, this amplitude uh, popped out. So here we are at 19,000 feet. You got 25% you got porosity sands here at 19,000 feet. Very good. So here's another one in Gulf of Mexico. Now this is fairly simple one. This is a uh, Mensa feet. See that strong amplitude there. Uh, and then I scaled it. I, I zoomed in and I got a much stronger uh, event. I, uh, I can map it in more detail here. It's mainly a simple closure with some faults, but there's probably a little stratigraphic variation as well. But look at this sand thickness here uh, a thick, fairly uniform uh, sand and a big, obvious, obvious bright spot, low impedance. Uh, 900 BCF uh, field. One thing about bright spots, it may help you find stratigraphic traps. Uh, this is called Ram Paul, it's the Gulf of Mexico, and you notice the seismic line there, those shingles, the trebidite shingles, you know, the trebidite sand sometimes have a tendency to go in pulses, and, uh, and so they shingle, and you see the soft gives a red there, and, and uh, so this is a, uh, is a channel. You see that bottom cartoon there on the bottom. You got a, a sand channel and a uh, levee, both sides of the channel. And so this is a 300 million bell stratigraphic trap. You know, it is on a weak structural nose. It's always, it's, it's always helpful when you have combination traps, you have a little structural help to find oil and gas. This one only has a weak nose. Most people call this a pure stratigraphic trap in the Gulf of Mexico, it would never, I don't think it would ever have been found without the, uh, the using uh, bright spot uh, technology. Here's one in Israel. Uh, this is really noble energy. Uh, 
uh, uh, Tamar field. This is a 10 TCF plus or minus field in offshore Israel. Uh, it has two or three amplitude anomalies and look at that flat spot. Now the flat spot has a sag on it. Why? Well, because it's full of lower velocity. Once you put that gas in there, it's gonna be lower velocity than the surrounding uh, sands and it's gonna have, and you have a sag effect in, in say time, in a, in a time section. And uh, there's also a couple other fields there. Uh, in, uh, there's several other fields here in Israel. So this is a major gas, uh, gas province uh, in the world now. And it's up in Cyprus. It's actually spread a little bit to the north here and in, in, into uh, Cyprus. So this is a classic. It's a big structure, by the way, with helps. It's, it's a four-way dip fault structure, which is a major factor, of course. This is offshore Mexico. Uh, Premier has this on their website. All this data, by the way, is public data I'm showing you. And there's a salt dome here, uh, a deep salt core, and there's an upthorn, there's a fault. See the fault here, salt core, and you got these amplitudes and a flat spot. I actually saw this uh, several years ago uh, prior to the well being drilled, and I said, oh my gosh, a salt core, upthorn fault trap. Uh, that means you got a, a good chance the top seal has been faulted down and sealing those, those sands, you know, sand against shale, or maybe even sand against salt if the salt made it up there. You got a series of amplitudes and you got a flat spot. My goodness, you, you don't have much better than that. It turns out that this is a 600 to 800 million barrel field. There's been several wells drilled here, like four, I think. And you see they got the log over there. It's thick, thick sand. Now look at that down dip. Con Con conformance. Remember, that's the number one characteristic you're looking for. This is more about that flat spot. And you say, well, the flat spot kind of comes and goes. Why? Well, because of the, the sand, it's not just one thickness sand. There's maybe some sequences there of sand versus shale and sand versus shale. So, so it's kind of, it comes and goes. It's intermittent, you see right here. Uh, but look at this, salt core, uh, the salt may leak their way up the fall, the fall amplitudes, flat spot, classic, classic. It doesn't get much better than this, by the way. And uh, now this is more complicated. This is offshore Norway in the Barents Sea, uh, uh, you know, uh, Equinor. From a structural standpoint, you can see you, you, you got a, a truncation, truncated section here in conformity and you got a fault here. So geologically, it looks like it's a reasonable uh, trapping situation. Well, there's actually two flat spots. There's a flat spot right here. That's a, and here's the amplitude, by the way. See that red comes down there and it terminates right there. It terminates at the flat spot here. So this is the gas oil contact here. This is the oil water contact here. So uh, this is kind of a long structural ridge. I don't have a map in this presentation, but this is a long, this is six, 800 million barrel feet from, from, from two or three fields. So uh, that's very, uh, very attractive. This is the one uh, that Alan showed when he, when he uh, advertised the, uh, the talk. This is a, uh, yeah, this is the bright spot with a down dip polarity reversal. In other words, down dip the sand is, is hard, you know, high impedance, and it reverses and goes to low impedance when you have gas in it. And so you get, you get a polarity reversal right there. And you obviously, it's thick, very thick gas sand, and it's not perfectly fat, uh, flat, maybe because of the gas, gas effect, uh, low velocity. So, uh, of course, these are, these, are, uh, these examples I'm showing you here are, are the ones that are spectacular. A lot of the amplitudes that we see around the world are more subtle than what I'm showing you here today. This is a field offshore Africa, Angola, uh, a stratigraphic trap, and this is in a channel environment. Look at this, the, uh, like an incised valley, and uh, where you have a series of sands deposited, and you have a number of faults, and this, and this is a 600 plus million barrel field in these in these turbidite sands where it's faulted and. Uh, 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 Total has this, by the way, very uh, uh, successful, very economic, very economic. It's a shallow depth. 
Uh, this one, I'm going to give you a little quiz. Um, this prospect is in an unknown area for the time being. And look at those amplitudes. You have three amplitudes. It says venture interval. Three amplitudes here. And you're up thrown to a fault. Now, you know, you have to be a little bit concerned here because this fault comes to the surface, almost to the surface. Uh, if you look at it in an in a east-west direction or strike direction, you see you got a nice rollover here, structural rollover. And this is, the, I think, the bottom one, one of the events. And you see it, it fits it fits a structural contour. So my goodness, I got uh, looks like a good uh, you know down dip con conformance, and it also has a possible flat spot right here. Well. Obviously, I'm, I'm playing a little game here. This is low saturation gas. Uh, it's in a, it's a, it was in a frontier basin, offshore Barbados, which is a, you know, it's really, it has a very small amount of oil and gas. Now, I happen to know two of them who drilled this well, and just to show you how two companies can have different numbers, one company called it a 70% probability of success, Company called it 20% probability of success. Two major companies had a difference from 20 to 70%. The company that had it 70% was bidding it, was evaluating it purely technical on, on the geophysics. The 20% said, my goodness, this is a frontier basin. We don't have calibration. We don't know, uh, we really don't know uh, uh, the details, and by the way, that, that fault may leak all the hydrocarbons out, which it did. This is low saturation. So on that, my final slide here, uh, a couple of slides. What, what should you think about when you're doing a, uh, a recommending a prospect to management, assuming you have a positive economics? Uh, would you recognize this feature as a prospect without the amplitude anomaly? You know, we, we have hydrocarbons that are, uh, I mean, you can, around the world, like in, uh, at great depths or in bad seismic data areas or in tidal rocks, but you don't have amplitude anomalies. But would you recognize this prospect if you didn't have, if you have the proper rock physics? Would you recognize reservoir without the amplitude? And this is the key question. If you have reviewed DHI true positives in the area successes, that, that's a good thing. Or, pos or the false positives. If you, you, you want to, have you, have, you, have you looked at the good and the bad? What works and what doesn't work? And then lastly, are these, if you have rock physics studies in an area and you expect bright spots, let's say you got a prospect at seven or 8,000 feet, it's a beautiful four way simple closure, and you say, oh, I should have bright spots, and there are none. Well, obviously, that's a negative. That has to be, it has to be higher risk. Uh, then you, now, it still could have hydrocarbons for so it could maybe lower porosity sand, it may be some unusual reservoir or something like that. But generally, if you, if you do the rock physics studies and you have a lot of true positives in the area and you don't, and you have a, a prospect without the amplitudes, you obviously have to be very concerned. So it'd be a, a, a negative. Here's a Exxon Mobil uh, paper that. Uh, you might want to read, it's in the APG bulletin, and they reviewed this, uh, they reviewed, uh, uh, I think, several, 500 wells from 2000, 1994 to 2015. So look on the top left there, the geologic success. They went in and on um, prospects they thought were high quality, in other words, a lot of, a lot of good amplitude characteristics in geology matched it and everything. They went in 5% and they actually end up to be 70%. That calibrates with my Correspond with my 70%, 80% number that I said earlier on good prospects. Whereas on purely geologic prospects, they were in the range of about 30%. So notice that's about a factor of two. So if you're in a bright spot country, in a bright spot basin, which is mainly offshore and a lot of it's deep water now, some of it's onshore, especially along the Gulf Coast, uh, offshore, uh, I mean, Texas and, and, and uh, uh, the US Gulf Coast area. Uh, and other parts of the US, but it's mainly an offshore technology. You can have a factor of two to one. You can go 35% up to 70%. Now they're not all economic. 
Uh, no, this is, in other words, we're, we're in business to make money for our company, so we have to have economic volumes. <coughs> so you can see that that 70% dropped down to about 50% on the DHIs. It's still pretty good. And the, on the geology, it dropped from about a 35 to about a 20 or 25. So uh, uh, I know of, of companies that have, uh, that only 10 or 20% of the DHI prospects are actually economic. So the economic factor is of course major. That's mainly for working with the engineers and with the company management. So I think that's my last slide. Oh, no, 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 this is the last one. Uh, all of the evolved teams have seen this, uh, this pie chart. Uh, and of course we know about the software and the workstations, uh, but I like the left side there, uh, resilience and curiosity, creativity. <coughs> you, have to, you, have to, you, have to, you have to stay with it. Um, tenacity, uh, keep thinking and working harder, and be curious and creative with your seismic data and integrate your geology and your physics. Of course, the right half, the 50%, is what we call this creative thinking. And it's uh, some of it's expert knowledge. Uh, and you've got business objectives you have to meet. So uh, you have to consider, uh, and the, the software is mainly a tool for you to reach th these, uh, your, uh, your, your goals of making good seismic interpretation. So I'll be back on August 21st with uh, I know AVO. Now I know the, the students, evolved students have not, you don't have any seismic gathers, you don't have what we call pre-stack data, uh, but uh, we're gonna go into AVO interpretation, best practices in a couple of weeks here, and I hope uh, that many of us, many of you can join us at that time. So Alan, that's a lot, I'll just turn it back to you, Alan. What's okay. Well, uh, let's give Mr. Forrest a uh, round of digital applause, those of you who can. So oh, if you unshare, unshare your screen, yeah, there we go. Hey, how long did I talk here? 50 minutes. Well, that's yeah. okay. We, about so, um, <clears throat> we have really kind of limited time for questions. There was one question I'll mention uh, that I sort of answered online, which was about what's a dim spot, and I explained that that's... Yeah, we're going to go in the, we're going to go in the dim spot at the next meeting, uh, the, yeah. at the AVO part. The dim spot is where the... It's usually low porosity, by the way, 10 or 20, uh, 10, 10 or 15 percent. That's where the amplitude is brighter. It dims over your prospect. We have examples of that, and I may be able to show them at the next meeting. The problem is dim spots are very difficult to find because, I mean, seismic lines have dim spots everywhere. And uh, so, uh, but some people think, and I guess I'm one of them, that, the, that we can still find oil and gas in the future on dim spots, which is a kind of tidal rock. And it, you have to calibrate very carefully with the rock physics. You, you, you know, that's in the ABO, you get into the ABO classification, that's a, that'll be in the, in, the, in the next talk. Okay, and if you can unshare your screen. Uh, let's see here, unshare, all right, what do I do? The red, I think it's the red. Uh, red. That's somewhere, what is it, the bottom, I think, right? What do I, how do I? They stop share. How do I? Uh, I think I okay. think you did it now. That's it. I think that that should be it. Yeah. Anyway, I know I covered a lot of, uh, especially in the first half, a lot of terminology. But if you don't, you have to understand that terminology, and and that uh, otherwise you would be uh, you you're not going to find much on it. You're going to make air. By the way, some people I didn't mention this you, years ago. Not as much uh, lately. People. <laughs> People, uh, they, they think got low impedance and they drill it and it's high impedance and it's salt. There's been some bright spot prospects that people have drilled in, into, into salt. That's, that's, a, that's a pitfall I didn't mention. But, uh, yeah. Okay, so we're down to, I think, one minute. So we'll probably need to uh, close out uh, to finish on the hour. Um, is my, my screen shared? I guess I talked yes. too long. Perfect. Yeah. I talked so, too long. I didn't have enough time for questions. That's okay. But we we got a couple in the chat, but uh, feel free to send your questions through the various channels. So just a reminder to everybody as we close out. So as we said, Mr. Forrest comes back in on the 21st to finish part two. And then we have Mr. Rocky Roden, someone uh, both of us have known for a long time, who's going to teach us or talk to us about what geoscientists should know about machine learning. 
Uh, in closing out, I will mention that if anybody likes what they've seen or heard about Evolve and you want to help support it, well, if you know any rich oil companies right now, they can come support teams on this link here. Um, and of course, uh, anybody can donate to the SEG website, which is the lower left here. And any donation over $10 is available and welcome. So we're going to close out here. Thank you very much to everybody for attending. And what we like to say is remember, SEG Evolve, we are not afraid of the future. We are the future. So we'll see you next time. Thank you.